an aspiring yogi wanted to find a guru. He went to an ashram, and his elderly preceptor told him, you can stay here, but we have one all-important rule. All students must observe a vow of silence. You will be allowed to speak one sentence only after 12 years' time. After practicing for 12 long years, the day came when the students the student could say one sentence. He came before the guru and said, the bed, it's too hard. He kept going for another 12 years of hard spiritual practices, austere discipline. And then came the opportunity to speak once again. He commented, the food is not very good. 12 more years come and go as more hard work, he once again gets the chance to speak after these 12 long years. This time, it's 36 years of practice has gone by when he announces, I quit. His guru reported, retorted, good. All you've done this whole time is complain, complain, complain. Time and voice. That's where we are as a country as well. We get to voice ourselves in our political system this coming week. Not everyone out there understands or even believes or has faith in our system. The younger generations simply ask the question what is the point? 41% of eligible voters in 2016 did not vote. It parallels the 37% of younger Americans with no religious affiliation. It's no coincidence. There is a lack of faith in our systems, our beliefs, whether it's religion, whether it's government. Just like the aspiring yogi this week, Americans will speak after a period of silence. So go and vote, and I encourage everyone. Um, it's part of, um, well, encouraging other generations to participate in something they feel disenfranchised from. Moving on to another topic, getting into the theology of the day. Some of you uh, know that Father Thomas Keating passed away recently. Over the years, I've come to appreciate Keating's works, largely through the influence of Father Richard Rohr, who had these words to say of Keating. One of my beloved teachers, Father Thomas Keating, passed away on Thursday, October 25th at his home monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts. Father Keating helped me and many others trust God's loving presence and experience its healing power through silence. He taught that God is infinitely and always present. The spiritual journey, Keating said, is a process of dismantling the monumental illusion that God is distant or absent. In prayer, there is no need for judgment or shame when our thoughts predictably start wandering down their usual rabbit holes. What matters is our desire, and even that is a gift of grace to return to presence again and again and again. Father Keating had a long lifetime, 95 years, to practice being present to presence. Now I trust that he will simply continue experiencing the mystery of union with God, which is not unknowable, but infinitely knowable. Along with fellow Trappists, William Menninger and Basil Pennington, Keating is known for developing the practice of centering prayer. He brought an accessible form and broader awareness to the Christian contemplative tradition, a path that is not only for monks and theologians, but for ordinary people. And I'll draw your attention to the opening quote that's printed in your bulletins. The gift of God is absolutely gratuitous, it's not something you earn. It's something that's there. It's something you just have to accept. 
This is the gift that has been given. There's no place to get it. There's no place you can go to avoid it. It just is. It's part of our very existence. And so the purpose of all great religions is to bring us into relationship with reality that is so intimate that no words can possibly describe it. And I really love that phraseology he has there. God is closer to all of us than we are to ourselves. God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Getting to that nature, the reality of God, it can be challenging because our minds are always stirring up things, constantly doing things that distract us. Stillness and presence is where the nature of God can be found. It's where we cultivate that connection to the living reality that we call God, that experience. And if it's simply up here, if it's a belief, it still has to make its leap from the belief to the experience. And once it makes that leap, well, now you're onto something. You're onto something real. The nature and quality of God. I think we tend to get these wrong. And I sometimes kind of joke about this semi-flippantly, but it's out there in the world. It's believe in my loving God or I'll kill you. There's a lot of people out there, a lot, who have a belief it's either my God, and that's the only existence that's real, my belief in that, and if you don't believe what I believe, well, there's going to be consequence. This is not the nature of God. Let's talk about the quality of God. And we can, yes, we can get to the basics of God is love. Well, that's a good start. That presence of living out, that quality in our lives, it's a challenge. If you're in a relationship, you know how challenging that can be. Whatever relationship that is, even if you're a contemplative, you're not always going to feel constant bliss. That in itself is part of this challenge. But simply understanding what the nature of God is, at least it's a step in the right direction. And you would consider that as long as religion has been around, we might have got this whole God thing figured out by now. But it turns out, as Keating is reflecting upon, it's returning to presence again and again and again. We may find it for a split second, and then we drift back to our normal state of consciousness, which is not quite love, not quite elevated in this higher realm. Having the attention to return to presence again and again. The nature of God and the qualities of God. Maybe it's easier to access those in our present time by figuring out what's not the quality of God. And I know we can look to the Old Testament and point to things that may be exceptions, but that's not what this sermon is about. Elevating it to the quality of love and love to our extending to our neighbor. Hatred and violence are definitely not the qualities of God. And our country experiencing this extraordinary rise in violence leading up to our midterm elections, the attack on the Tree of Life synagogue. Some of these get elevated to something of goodness, and I think we need to be vigilant on simply pointing out and saying these are not godly qualities. What today's sermon is about is understanding the oneness of God that prevails. It is universal. It transcends even religion. The sentiment is an invitation to grow closer in relationship to the living God. And that could be the God of your own understanding as it is presently. Because hopefully it's going to change. It's going to shift. As you deepen your relationship with God, your understanding of even who you are will shift as your understanding deepens in the experience of actually having that feeling relationship with God. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them on your children, to your children, and talk about them when you're at home, when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, I know some households do actually have these on their doorposts. I haven't met anyone yet that has it written on their forehead yet. We'll see. The point is, that sentiment is not only just to be lip service. It's not something that we talk about, that we nod and agree this is a good thing. It's to be lived out in your daily interactions. If there's anything that we can do as individuals in our own spiritual life that has an impact day in, day out, consider the qualities of every interaction you have with every other human being week in, week out. What are the qualities of those interactions? Do you take a moment to actually look someone in the eyes, gaze, have a connection with another living human being? And I gave spiritual homework a few weeks ago to actually not only do that, but follow it up by, by giving someone positivity, uplifting them, looking someone in the eye. They had to be uh, another human being. I said in a pinch you could do uh, FaceTime or Skype or something like that. But preferably, real-time human interaction. We actually lock eyes and exchange some positivity. It could be simply going to get groceries and you actually have a real exchange with whoever is there with you in that moment. See how that makes you feel, that exchange. One God. Now what's fascinating, and I had to remind people last week that uh, Jesus lived his life as a Jewish rabbi, a teacher of the law. He had studied the scriptures. A lot of people forget they, they kind of separate Christianity from Jesus as the Jewish rabbi. But this is the message he gives. He expands the nature of God to the universal oneness that is already there. Which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered. The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Loving one another, loving the one God. It can be a challenge, no doubt. The person sitting next to you right now, while they may be voting differently, you can still extend a wishing of wellness to whoever that is. That spark of divinity that is within them is the same spark of divinity within every other human being on the planet. The great tragedy of our time is that we can be ever so quick to anger, living from our heads, and that then corrupt our hearts. How much of our daily lives, if we're honest, do we dedicate to God, to cultivating that depth of connection, to feeling God's presence? We've become far too familiar with noise and conflict and pain. And sometimes we feed that by our daily dosage of news, completely forgetting the force of God, forgetting the God qualities of peace, tranquility, joy. Anger is usually a covering up of unresolved pain that resides underneath it. Stillness is what's required to actually access the pain that's underneath, to transmute that suffering into spiritual enlightenment. Whatever pain you've gone through, and everyone has some pain in life, unless you're willing to address it head on and feel it, you will not be able to transmute that into some enlightened peace. And the truth spiritually is the more pain you have, the more that that becomes the fuel for your spiritual enlightenment. So if there's pain and suffering in your life, use it wisely. Use it as goodness, as joy, as the qualities that we know that are godly. 
the one God. We've also forgotten our identity as a species. The truth is we're all beloved children of God, without exception. And we've forgotten to reflect back that nature, not only with ourselves, but with our neighbors. I'm going to read a piece of Roar here because I believe what he says here at least gets us in the directionally correct way of understanding the nature of God. Divine love is compassionate, tender, luminous, totally self-giving, seeking no reward, unifying everything. And that's a quote from Thomas Keating. Every act of complete self-giving in the name of fullness, even though you feel like you are isolated, ignored, unconnected, and meaningless, connects you immediately to the fullness of love. That's what happened in Jesus' case. That's what he is teaching. It seems to me Christianity has put major emphasis on us loving God, but in the mystics I consistently find an overwhelming experience of how God loves us. This comes through most of their writings. God is the initiator. God is the doer. God is the one who seduces us. It's all about God's initiative. Then we certainly want to love back the way that we have been loved. And he says, as, as my father St. Francis would often say, love is not loved. Love is not loved. I want to love back the way that I have been loved. But it's not like I've got to prove my love for God by doing things. My job is simply to complete the circuit. The mystics experience this full body blow of the divine loving and accepting them. And the rest of their life is about trying to verbalize and embody that. They invariably find ways to give that love back through forms of service and worship. But it's never earning the love. It's always returning the love. Can you feel the difference? God's love is almost a different language. It's not based in fear, but in ecstasy. God is always given, incarnate in every moment, and present to those who know how to be present themselves. It is that simple and that difficult. To be present in prayer can be like the experience of being loved at a deep level. I hope you have felt such intimacy alone with God. I promise it is available to you. Maybe a lot of us just need to be told that this divine intimacy is what we should expect and seek. We're afraid to ask for it. We're afraid to seek it. It feels presumptuous. We can't, we can't trust that such a love exists and for us, but it does. And I just told you. Which commandment is the first of all, Jesus answered. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Amen.